we are the only intelligent life in the known universe. I mean, imagine that we're the only place where there is intelligence in this galaxy. Astronomers throughout the world are in awe of this revolutionary discovery. The James Webb Space Telescope has captured the elusive glow of city lights an incredible seven trillion miles distant from Earth, exceeding all expectations. This mind-blowing achievement does more than just expand our horizons in terms of what we know about the universe. Speculation runs rampant as scientists pore over the data, searching for clues that could unlock the secrets of these mysterious celestial beacons. The implications are staggering, proof that we are not alone in the universe, that the universe teems with life and activity far beyond our comprehension. Is it possible that these faraway lights indicate the existence of extraterrestrial cultures? What does this mean for our knowledge of the likelihood of life in the universe beyond Earth? Join us as we explore how the James Webb Telescope just observed city lights seven trillion miles away. Launched into orbit on Christmas Day 2021, the James Webb Space Telescope aimed to surpass the long-standing Hubble Telescope in capturing exceptionally sharp photos of newly discovered celestial objects, planetary systems, and more. A scientific objective of the JWST is to study the formation of the first galaxies by peering into the distant regions of the universe. This is feasible due to the fact that the journey time of light throughout our universe is billions of years. When the JWST gathers light, it sees these objects exactly as they were billions of years ago. Astronomers measure distances in light years, which is the maximum distance light can travel in a year, to account for this fact. And the team's initial graphic made a point of emphasizing this. It was a deep field image that was presented on July 11, 2022, by U.S. President Joseph Biden while he was speaking from the White House. As the Hubble Space Telescope focused on a single area of the sky for 10 straight days beginning on December 18, 1995, deep fields gained notoriety. The chosen area was merely a microscopic dot, making up around one millionth of the entire sky. The majority of the 3,000 previously undiscovered objects found by Hubble were galaxies that are located billions of light years away. With its focal point on the SMAX 0723 galaxy cluster, the JWST's deep field covers a similarly small sky area. The actual galaxy, SMAX 0723, is 4.6 billion light years away. The more distant galaxies behind it are magnified by its powerful gravitational field. The background galaxies are distorted into large arcs where the gravitational field is strongest. In one instance, it was determined that it took a distant galaxy's light 13.1 billion years to reach the telescope after traveling through space. The light that is being released stretches as the universe grows. As they are so far away, the main target galaxies of the JWST have stretched visible light from their stars into the infrared. Astronomers can directly compare JWST views with visible light photos of nearby galaxies taken by Hubble and other telescopes by gathering data at those wavelengths. This will demonstrate how galaxies develop throughout cosmic time, enlarging and consolidating into the structures we observe today. Even more astounding than the sheer number of galaxies in the JWST's first deep field image is how quickly it was captured in only hours as opposed to days. Practically wherever it searches, it cannot help but find galaxies. Galaxy clusters aren't the only objects acting as magnifying lenses. Scientists use the JWST to capture an image of a pair of galaxies, designated VV191, so they could study how the light from one of the pairs altered as it went through the other. The results of the investigation will reveal the properties of the intervening galaxy's dust and it looks like the JWST may have just made a groundbreaking discovery light years outside our solar system. The announcement of the possible discovery of Aurorae as lights on a so-called brown dwarf came from the official JWST website. The absence of a host star 
and the frigid temperature make it difficult to pinpoint where the energy in the upper atmosphere is coming from. However, it is believed that the object releasing the aurorae is really spewing methane. Simply said, an aurora on Earth is created when energetic particles that make their way into space from the sun are captured by our planet's magnetic field. The charged particles then make their way to Earth's atmosphere via lines of magnetic fields near the poles, where they will collide with gas molecules to produce a beautiful display of light known as the Northern Lights. Jupiter and Saturn have similar aurorae phenomena to do with the solar wind, but brown dwarf W1935 has no star to orbit, so its aurorae are a huge mystery. Everyone's hopes continue to rest on Proxima Centauri. B. Just 4.24 light years from Earth and within the Milky Way galaxy. With scientists detecting the presence of water on the exoplanet, the possibility of life on the planet can't be ruled out. Are we finally going to see evidence of life beyond Earth? Just last month, JWST found yet another supermassive black hole that was red in color and devoured everything around it. This discovery is 40 million times as big as the sun. But what does it mean for us? That the JWST has found another supermassive black hole that has been there since the beginning of the universe might not be good news. This monster is rapidly devouring everything in its direct vicinity. Leading the discovery are Dr. Lucas Furtok and Professor Adi Zitrin of the Ben-Gurion University of the Negev in Israel. According to their discoveries, the supermassive black hole is practically 40 times heavier than the Sun, making it a gigantic monster in comparison to the galaxy it resides in. Fortunately, it is not in close proximity to Earth or the solar system. We're talking quite the distance at 12.9 billion light years away from our planet. But it is getting closer with the black hole devouring everything around it at a quick rate. It's where the reddish color comes from, indicating that it sits in a thick veil of dust that's obscuring most light from passing through. When JWST began transmitting its initial data, scientists were ecstatic. While going through the data that came in for the Uncover program, three small objects with a crimson glow attracted our attention. We instantly suspected that it was a quasar-like object supermassive black holes at the centers of galaxies that are continuously accreting material. Because of their red dot look, the entire galaxy's luminosity can't possibly be contained within a spot no larger than a modern star cluster. We were able to obtain very precise size constraints due to the source's gravitational lensing. Even when all the potential stars are compressed into that tiny area, the black hole still accounts for at least 1% of the system's total mass. The discovery of similar behavior in multiple additional early universe supermassive black holes has shed light on the growth of both the black hole and the host galaxy, as well as the interaction between the two, which is still mostly unknown. If supermassive black holes form, for instance, from star leftovers or maybe from primordial cosmic material that collapsed into black holes, astronomers have no idea. Also, in the pictures it transmits back to Earth, the James Webb Space Telescope is finding some other rather strange things. Every night, we have the privilege of gazing into space and being enchanted by the dazzling lights of planets and stars that float across the universe, countless light years away. Plus, the James Webb Space Telescope allows us to see a lot more than what our eyes can detect. Like, for example, a question mark in space. For the past 20 plus months, Webb has been gliding through space, transmitting back pictures of what it has found in deep space using its state-of-the-art near-infrared camera. And now answers have been given to the discovery of a rather peculiar-looking finding in one Webb image, focusing on something completely different. The image was released by the European Space Agency, looking at two young stars as they form some 1,470 light-years from Earth. However, there is a small orange mark at the image's base that resembles a flipped question mark. Obviously, the little image isn't tiny at all. In fact, it's very enormous. The question mark was captured while observing the pair of young stars dubbed Herbig Haro, 46 to 47. 
cosmic beauties. They are surrounded by massive disks of dust and gas with the entity only a few thousand years old itself. As for the question mark shape itself, it may well look like that, due to the two-dimensional image that's been presented by Webb from its specific viewpoint. At this point, we don't know what it is, and without additional research, we might never know. However, the findings have been reviewed by experts in the field. Thus, it is most likely a faraway galaxy or possibly galaxies that are interacting with one another. The distorted question mark form could be a result of their interactions. Perhaps we have never seen this thing before. To determine its identity with any degree of certainty, further investigation is necessary. With the abundance of distant galaxies revealed by Webb, there is an abundance of fresh scientific inquiry. Now all eyes are focusing on a specific set of Earth-sized planets that could hold the key to finding alien life close to home. The Fermi Paradox, which highlights the absence of evidence for advanced alien life in the cosmos dispute, the statistically high probability that such beings exist, might finally be resolved. Where are these planets? Sitting some 40 light years away from Earth and the solar system is a star known as Trappist-1, which has seven planets orbiting it. In their quest to discover habitable planets, NASA takes into account a wide range of parameters beyond a planet's size and distance from its star. A more effective approach would be to identify the relative concentrations of these compounds in a planet's atmosphere. This would allow researchers to determine if the planet is habitable. The Infrared Spitzer Space Telescope, which is part of NASA's space exploration mission, helped find the seven rocky exoplanets orbiting the same star, known as TRAPPIST-1, six years ago. The James Webb Space Telescope has now measured the temperature of TRAPPIST-1b, one of those worlds. The JWST has been consistently delivering noteworthy findings since its introduction, and this discovery is only the latest in a string of record-breaking firsts. This is the first detection of any form of light emitted by an exoplanet as small and as cool as the rocky planets in our own solar system. No previous telescopes have had the sensitivity to measure such dim, mid-infrared light. Astronomers were ecstatic when they first learned about the seven TRAPPIST-1 exoplanets because these faraway worlds are all around Earth's size and are in the habitable zone, the area where planets can have liquid water on their surfaces at the ideal distance from their star. They call this system a great laboratory and say it's one of the greatest places to study rocky planet atmospheres. Don't get too excited about a new world for humans yet though. The TRAPPIST-1 planets are out of our current reach at a whopping 235 trillion miles away. They're also orbiting a star much smaller and redder than our sun, known as an M dwarf star. These stars are 10 times more common in the Milky Way than sun-like stars and they have double the likelihood of having rocky planets as sun-like stars. These massive M dwarfs are prime targets for habitable planet hunters, and rocky planets orbiting these dwarf stars can be more easily observed. However, there is a catch. M dwarfs are significantly more active than our sun, and they frequently flare and emit high energy rays, which could be harmful to emerging extraterrestrial life or a planet's atmosphere. In the past, observations of TRAPPIST-1b were not sensitive enough to rule out the possibility of an atmosphere or the planet's nature as a barren rock. Since the planet is tidally locked to its star, one side is always facing the star, and the other is trapped in perpetual night, as predicted by simulations. If TRAPPIST-1b had an atmosphere, the temperature of the planet would be lower because the air would redistribute the heat around both sides. However, the JWST measured a much higher temperature, thus ruling out the possibility of an atmosphere and removing another planet from the list of potentially habitable worlds. Nevertheless, what's exciting is not so much about TRAPPIST-1b as it is the fact that the JWST can and will make such observations, allowing us to probe the atmospheres and temperatures of countless more worlds. What would life on these planets look like? The James Webb Space Telescope has decided to step into the shoes of an extraterrestrial meteorologist, engaging in some space exploration once again. The super expensive piece of space tech 
has been harnessed by a team of international astronomers looking to harness its powers across the universe. It's the latest in a short but rich history of cosmic exploration, which includes taking snaps of a nearby moon that looks eerily like Earth. This is only the beginning of its galactic treasure hunt. When it comes to weather, Webb has been mapping exactly what's been going on a massive planet some 280 light years away. That's roughly 164.64 trillion miles from Earth. The planet, called WASP-43b, is roughly the same size as Jupiter, dubbed a hot Jupiter by NASA after being discovered by the Hubble Space Telescope in 2011. The weather forecasts have revealed one 250 C heat and equatorial winds faster than 5,000 miles per hour. It had all been hidden under massive, thick, high clouds covering the night side of the planet. The reason behind this is that WASP-43b is tidally locked, meaning that although one side is always exposed to the light from the nearest star, the other side, which has a pristine sky, never experiences any light at all. By combining precise brightness measurements over a wide range of mid-infrared light with 3D climate models and prior observations from other telescopes, Webb was able to confirm that water vapor is present on the day side, while Spitzer and Hubble both hinted at the possibility of clouds on the night side. More accurate readings from Webb were necessary, though, before we could start to map the planet's climate, cloud cover, winds, and atmospheric composition by region. WASP-43b takes 19.5 hours to go around its star, with the JWST measuring tiny changes in brightness of the planet and its neighbors. Webb utilized brightness data acquired by its state-of-the-art near-infrared camera to determine the planet's temperature. The quantity of mid-infrared light emitted by an object is strongly related to its temperature, which was crucial to the results for which measurements were taken every 10 seconds for over 24 hours. We were able to derive a rough map of the planet's temperature from our observations during a whole orbit, which allowed us to determine the temperature of the various sides of the planet as they came into view. The side of the planet that is continually basking in sunlight has an average temperature of almost 2,282 degrees Fahrenheit, which is hot enough to melt iron and most other metals. The dark side is significantly cooler, but still boiling at around 1,112 degrees Fahrenheit. The rapid circulation of heated air due to supersonic winds prevents the production of methane, a stable and observable gas on the dark side of the planet. The fact that this method of temperature mapping is possible is a clear indication of how sensitive and stable Webb is. Scientists infer from the lack of methane that WASP-43b experiences winds of magnitudes greater than 5,000 miles per hour. At such velocities, the anticipated chemical reactions would not have time to produce detectable quantities of methane on the night side. Furthermore, just days after finding a real surprise at the beginning of the universe, the equipment is turning its near-infrared camera towards the distant planet, all eyes on a planet eight times the size of Earth. Called K218b, the planet orbits around a cooling dwarf star called K218, some 120 light years from our planet. Weighing in at 8.6 times the size of Earth, scientists studying the planet have found a gas that to human knowledge can only be produced by life itself. While K218b is deficient in ammonia, it is rich in other Earth-derived chemical components, such as carbon dioxide and methane. Because of this chemical imbalance, Astronomers have proposed the idea of Hycian exoplanets, which would have vast oceans covering their surface and an atmosphere rich with hydrogen. The JWST observations have been crucial in guiding us thus far. Initial web observations also provided a possible detection of a molecule called dimethyl sulfide, DMS, NASA says. On Earth, this is only produced by life. The bulk of the DMS in Earth's atmosphere is emitted from phytoplankton in marine environments. We won't know the results of the new tests by JWST for months on end, with them needing to be analyzed, peer-reviewed, and then published to the public. Nine years have passed since K218b was first identified. In that time, 
water vapor was detected in its atmosphere. And most recently, JWST reported the presence of carbon dioxide and methane in its atmosphere. There is no guarantee that K218b can support life, despite the fact that it lies in the habitable zone of its star. Currently, the level of certainty among researchers about the presence of DMS on Earth exceeds 50%. While this level of certainty is not yet definitive, it fosters high expectations for future discoveries. The outcome of this discovery may not be good news for us. This spacecraft has unsettled something terrifying beyond our solar system. Not content to stop at becoming the farthest man-made object from Earth, the Voyager 1 spacecraft just entered a strange new zone at the frontier of the solar system, which has physicists scratching their heads. We couldn't have predicted anything like it. NASA originally anticipated that Voyager's entry into this new region, when galactic influences became more noticeable, would be uneventful and slow. However, it turned out to be significantly more intricate than they had anticipated. Since the spacecraft is currently running into an odd area, that experts are finding difficult to understand. Over the course of their over 46 years in orbit, the Voyager missions have been instrumental in revealing the solar system's actual state to the scientific community. Yet, it was never planned for these missions to go this long. The idea to send out probes in the 1970s was created by pure accident when Michael Minovich realized that a spacecraft could piggyback on the velocity of a planet and catapult further out into the solar system. This led to the first plans for the probe being carried out. The Voyager mission was originally intended to span five years, according to NASA officials. Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 are nonetheless still traveling and collecting important scientific data from the furthest reaches of space. The two spacecraft were launched weeks apart in the summer of 1977. The missions Voyager 1 and 2 were created to investigate Jupiter and Saturn. Studies of those planets were successfully completed by both missions. Afterward, Voyager 2 conducted the first ever close-up observations of Neptune and Uranus in 1989 and 1986, respectively. The flybys of the four planets were dubbed the Voyager Grand Tour. The two spacecraft subsequently embarked on an additional mission to explore distant parts of space. In 2013, NASA announced that Voyager 1 had crossed the boundary between our solar system and interstellar space. Spatial distances between stars are called interstellar distances. According to researchers, the beginning of interstellar space is where the sun's magnetic field and continuous flow of particles end. Voyager 2 eventually traveled into interstellar space in 2018. The spacecraft was 11 billion miles from the sun at this time. The Voyagers are the sole spacecraft that have ventured into interstellar space thus far. Together, the two explorers investigated how charged particles from the sun, the solar wind, interacted with space. Also, they have looked into the heliosphere, the protective sphere that surrounds our solar system. The solar wind forms the heliosphere, which is then influenced and changed by interstellar conditions. NASA claims that the Voyager spacecraft has provided new information on interstellar space. For instance, they found that cosmic rays are roughly three times more intense outside of the heliopause than they are inside the heliosphere. Scientists merged Voyager's findings with data from subsequent missions to gain a fuller picture of our solar system and the heliosphere's interactions with interstellar space. Voyager 1 recorded a buzzing noise that was associated with waves picked up in trace amounts of gas found in the mostly empty interstellar medium, according to NASA. Over the years, the Voyager spacecraft has learned a great deal about our star and its effects on our solar system. Experts are still confused by how the Voyagers managed to operate in temperatures significantly lower than their original parameters. Researchers have also found evidence of strange activity outside the solar system. Voyager 1 did surprise people, but it didn't reveal everything. Its plasma temperature measurement device stopped working back in 1980. However, 
Voyager 2's plasma instrument was still in excellent condition, allowing for a considerably clearer view of the heliopause when it passed on November 5th, 2018. For the first time, scientists could observe that the plasma surrounding an object slows down, warms up, and becomes denser as it approaches the heliopause by 140 million miles. The interstellar medium is at least 54,000 degrees Fahrenheit on the opposite side of the boundary, which is hotter than anticipated. The average temperature in the area surrounding the Voyager probes, however, continues to be quite low since this plasma is so thin and diffuse. The heliopause is also a leaking barrier, and the leaks flow both ways, according to Voyager 2. Voyager 1 sped through tendrils of interstellar particles that had pierced the heliopause-like tree roots through the rock before passing through it. However, Voyager 2 observed a thin stream of low-energy particles that continued more than 100 million miles past the heliopause. As Voyager 1 approached the heliopause by 800 million miles, a new mystery emerged as it entered a region resembling limbo where the outward solar wind slowed to a crawl. Voyager 2 observed the solar wind forming a completely different type of layer before it crossed the heliopause, which strangely was almost the same width as the static layer seen by Voyager 1. More specifically, prior to the Voyager missions, astronomers projected that as one traveled further and further away from the Sun, the solar bubble simply disintegrated into interstellar space. Voyager 2 seems to have verified the presence of a really obvious barrier in that area. The plasma densities detected by Voyager 1 and 2, as measured by the spacecraft's plasma wave instrument, were extremely similar. As you get beyond the boundary between the very hot solar plasma and the very cold interstellar plasma, the density of the plasma increases by a factor of 20 to 50. Fluids have that quality, and they often create boundaries that are very sharp. Most shocking to scientists was the fact that the Voyager's relative distances from the heliopause were identical. Previous models made strong predictions that the bubble's boundary should have moved farther out due to increased solar activity during Voyager 1's flyby in 2012. The heliopause should have retreated a little bit during Voyager 2's passing last year during a period of low solar activity. There is now some misunderstanding about the fact that both spacecraft left the solar system at two quite different locations, yet roughly the same distance. Additionally, Voyager 2 made several discoveries that, at least in our opinion, don't line up with a sharp border. The magnetic field measurements both inside and outside the bubble are the largest of these. The magnetic field's orientation between the two was predicted by astronomers to be substantially different. While traversing this thin surface, Voyager 1 and 2 both observed that there was essentially no change in the direction of the field. Simultaneously, the magnetic field measurements taken by Voyager 2 suggest that it encountered a less complex and less dense heliopause populated with lower energy particles compared to the one that Voyager 1 encountered. Again, there are more questions than answers raised by this mountain of data. The rest of the solar system is shaped by coronal mass ejections, which the Sun frequently spews forth as shock waves of plasma. It appears that the Sun's influence extends beyond its own area. The data from Voyager 2 and Voyager 1 before demonstrates how coronal mass ejections spread past the heliopause and reduce the cosmic ray flux beyond the bubble. This resembles what you may learn about the galaxy in some ways. Although far more intensely than coronal mass ejections, supernovae agitate the interstellar medium by sending shockwaves out into the galaxy as well. Most scientists agree that a supernova's interstellar shockwave caused even the solar system to form. These results support the hypothesis that the sun may also affect the evolution of life on other worlds, both in our solar system and elsewhere if we consider the possibility that cosmic rays may cause biological mutations in life on Earth. We will continue to learn from the two missions about how the Sun's heliosphere interacts with interstellar space, and they will also provide us with information about other star systems. 
We only managed to cross this entire bubble with two points. Two instances are insufficient. A more comprehensive understanding of the heliosphere is necessary to solve these mysteries. Both Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 left the heliosphere close to its leading edge when it collided with the interstellar medium. The shape of the heliosphere's wake is unknown to us because we lack data on it. The heliosphere may be roughly spherical due to the pressure of the interstellar medium, but it is also plausible that it has a comet-like tail or is shaped like a croissant. However, as other spacecraft are now traveling outside our solar system, they won't be able to collect data from the heliopause. At more than 31,000 miles per hour, NASA's New Horizons spacecraft is leaving the solar system. When its power runs out in the 2030s, it will stop moving more than a billion miles shy of the heliosphere's outer border. For this reason, Voyager researchers and others are advocating for a further interstellar mission. A 50-year mission with multiple generations is intended to study the solar system's furthest regions before moving on to uncharted territory beyond the solar wind. However, the heliopause observations nearly served as the final act for both spacecraft. Solar power isn't practical in the enormous void of outer space, which is unfathomably far from our sun. Because of this, engineers installed three radioisotope thermoelectric generators, or RTGs, on each Voyager. These function by generating energy from the heat produced by the radioactive fuel, plutonium-238. They essentially function as nuclear batteries, and they are eventually losing power at a predictable rate of 4 watts annually. The Voyagers don't require much power for propulsion, but it is necessary for them to be able to gather scientific data on distant magnetic fields and charged particles, which is now the sole option for humanity to do so in interstellar space. NASA started looking for ways to extend the instrument life of the Voyagers a few years ago. In 2019, the first step was to begin shutting off the heaters for the scientific apparatus. That was successful. The equipment continued to function despite a 122 degrees Fahrenheit reduction in temperature, which was far colder than the settings in which it had been tested. Nevertheless, it was still not enough. So in late March, a crew from NASA installed an energy-saving technique on Voyager 2 that uses some backup power to protect systems from sudden voltage spikes. Unfortunately, Voyager 1 stopped transmitting any data to Earth in November of last year, suggesting that no engineering or scientific information was being sent back. Fixing the fault of the universe's most isolated spacecraft isn't as easy as Pi. The abrupt break in communication left NASA perplexed as the probe was transmitting vital information about the stuff between the stars. The spacecraft is 15 billion miles away, speeding along at 32,000 miles per hour, meaning any commands sent from mission controllers take 22.5 hours to reach the little probe. And once they arrive, the engineering team must wait the same time again for a response. NASA has been working on the issue for more than five months. The original plan in March was to give the spacecraft a digital poke. Using a technique similar to a dentist using air puffs to detect cavities on teeth, the NASA team sent up a command instructing the spacecraft to send a complete memory readout back to Earth, highlighting any faulty parts. The flight data subsystem, one of Voyager's three onboard computers, is in charge of packaging the science and engineering data before returning it to Earth. This chip is where the poke reported malfunction was discovered. Because of the bug, the computer was producing repeating gibberish consisting of binary ones and zeros, giving the impression that it was stuck rather than providing science, temperature, and engineering data. The damaged chip could not be replaced, so NASA devised a clever solution that required moving the problematic code to another location in the flight data subsystem memory. The fact that no single site could contain the complete portion of the code, however, added to the complexity of the situation. They therefore came up with a strategy to separate the impacted code into manageable chunks and relocate those chunks within the computer system's memory while maintaining communication and collaboration. Now the Jet Propulsion Laboratory of NASA 
has officially declared that Voyager is back in service following the most remarkable long-range software update in history. We now eagerly await the influx of Voyager 1 scientific data in the upcoming weeks. Although the reason for the malfunctioning chip is unknown, the team believes it may have been damaged by an energetic particle from space or that it may have just worn out after 46 years. While cosmic rays are Voyager 1's main area of study, the scientists are also interested in a strange occurrence they've dubbed Pressure Front 2, an increase in the density of plasma and magnetic field around the spacecraft. It's unclear to NASA if this is a solar or interstellar occurrence. Prior to that, the troubleshooting status of Voyager 2 was revealed by NASA. The first signs that something was wrong with the spacecraft came during a rotation maneuver that Voyager was scheduled to carry out to calibrate its magnetic field instrument. The calibration procedure called for the drone to roll a full 360 degrees. Due to the craft's inability to complete the move, two power-hungry systems turned on and activated for longer than necessary, using more power than they should have. Power on Voyager 2 is extremely constrained. It generates heat that is then transformed into power using radioactive fuel. But with time, the fuel's ability to generate power decreases as it degrades. In order to protect key functions, the vessel turns off non-essential systems, including its scientific instruments, when power levels become too low. Voyager 2 disabled its scientific equipment after the rotation maneuver failed, making it unable to gather new data. As the craft is so far away from Earth that it takes 17 hours for commands to reach it, and another 17 hours for the ground team to see the ship's response, the engineers had to work to try and remedy the problem from the ground, which is very challenging. Yet despite the difficulties, the team was able to restart Voyager 2's instruments. With all of its systems back up and running, Voyager 2 can finally accomplish its mission of exploring the enormous gap between stars and collecting data on its surroundings. Voyager 2's relationship with extraterrestrials is another possibility. How much of it is true and how much actually happened? To give some idea of how far away Voyager 2 is from Earth, keep in mind that commands sent from Earth take 13 hours to reach the spacecraft. The problem is that communication isn't necessarily black and white. It wasn't until late 2021 that the possibility that the explorer had encountered a peculiar issue became evident. As soon as this problem arose, conspiracy theorists wasted no time turning it into widespread speculation. Some speculate that extraterrestrials stole the Voyager 2 probe and modified it so that it could no longer communicate with Earth. It could have simply been written off as garbage, but a German expert claims that this glitch can only be the product of alien activity. The UK's The Telegraph also stepped forward and elaborated on rumors, accepting the word of a UFO expert without contrasting it with trustworthy data from an individual who is informed about space. It is still far from clear whether a UFO or aliens were engaged in this operation, and the most likely explanation is that something went wrong with Voyager's programming. Nonetheless, there is no doubt that the alien theory will continue to be discussed for a very long time. For decades, NASA spacecraft have sent messages into space and now a new study has determined when we may begin to receive responses to those signals. A team of experts, based in California, looked at a number of U.S. Space Agency probes. Voyager 1, Voyager 2, Pioneer 10, Pioneer 11, and New Horizons. These spacecraft have downloaded crucial data about the universe by communicating with specialized deep space radio antennae. These antennas have sent signals into space where they have reached the spaceship and beyond. Riley Derrick and Howard Isaacson, the study's authors, state that these transmissions have encountered and will encounter other stars, raising the prospect that intelligent life in distant solar systems may encounter our terrestrial transmissions. As a result of their efforts, Derrick, Isaacson, and colleagues were able to identify places where possible intelligent extraterrestrial life would encounter terrestrial transmissions and potentially return transmissions toward the Earth by determining which stars will actually receive these signals. The date of these interactions could also be calculated, 
allowing them to determine the time and place of these contacts with aliens. If there is an advanced civilization living around the White Dwarf, we could hear back from them as early as 2029, the study found. Elsewhere, signals from Voyager 2 reached both an M Dwarf and a Brown Dwarf in 2007. The earliest we could expect a return signal from these would be 2033. At the same time, Voyager 1 is engaging in some long ball maneuvers. The crew has determined that the spacecraft will contact 277 stars by 2341, with its transmissions not reaching their first star until 2044. The odds of us receiving a reply to these signals are boosted by the fact that it won't just be stars that receive them. According to reports, Derek and Isaacson have come to the conclusion that the planets in the vicinity of the stars that have been contacted will also receive messages from the spaceship. And now we wait. This is not just another anomaly. It's a mystery begging to be solved, a puzzle whose pieces defy comprehension. In the silent reaches of space, where the stars twinkle like distant beacons of possibility, a NASA satellite has suddenly discovered something startling nestled snugly between the blue jewel of our planet and the veiled mystery of Venus. Some people think we may have encountered extraterrestrials or found long-lost relics from advanced civilizations. Others murmur about gravitational anomalies which ripple through space-time. As data pour in and begin to form a picture of cosmic chaos, scientists at NASA hold their breath. What mysteries may lie within this emptiness of space and what might be hidden there? Join us as we explore whatever lies hidden between Earth and Venus, a truth that may forever change the course of our journey among the stars. High in the toxic atmosphere of the planet Venus, astronomers on Earth have discovered signs of what might be life. Venus, named after the Roman goddess of beauty, burns at temperatures of hundreds of degrees and is cloaked by clouds that contain droplets of corrosive sulfuric acid. Few have focused on the rocky planet as a habitat for something living. Scientists have instead spent decades looking for evidence of life on other celestial bodies, most notably the icy moons of the big planets Europa and Enceladus, as well as Mars itself. The astronomers have not collected specimens of Venusian microbes, nor have they snapped any pictures of them. But with powerful telescopes, they have detected a chemical, phosphin, in the thick Venus atmosphere. After much analysis, the scientists assert that something now alive is the only explanation for the chemical source. On the other hand, there are scientists who don't buy into this theory and think the gas may be the product of some planet's mysterious atmosphere or geology. Some planetary scientists may be prompted by the discovery to wonder if we have missed a planet that was once more Earth-like than any other planet in our solar system. Venus is one of the most beautiful objects in Earth's sky, but at a closer glance, the less lovely it becomes. With a mass almost identical to Earth's, Venus is often referred to as the twin planet. In the past, Venus may have had an atmosphere that allowed life as we know it to thrive, according to several scientists. Earth was not exactly a welcoming place for creatures like us when the solar system was younger. There was life here then, even an entire biosphere that did not survive in the oxygen-rich environment that later developed. Something turned Venus into hell, just as Earth became a home for ferns, jellyfish, dinosaurs, and humans. Today, the second planet from the Sun has an atmosphere stifled by carbon dioxide gas and surface temperatures that average more than 800 degrees Fahrenheit. The dense atmosphere of Venus exerts a pressure of more than 1,300 pounds per square inch on anything at the surface. That is more than 90 times the 14.7 pounds per square inch at sea level on Earth, or the equivalent of being 3,000 feet underwater in the ocean. It is hardly a place that makes visiting or research easy, although that doesn't mean people haven't tried. Numerous robotic Venus missions, including several in the Soviet Union's Venera series, have been attempted by space projects. Unfortunately, spacecraft that land on this planet will be crushed within minutes as the planet eats metal. Out of all those endeavors, just two were successful in taking direct pictures of the surface of the planet. Despite Venus's scorching surface, there is a cloud layer at 86 degrees Fahrenheit and a pressure comparable to Earth's ground level 
just 31 miles below the surface of its atmosphere. A number of planetary scientists have speculated on the possibility of life on that planet, including Carl Sagan and Harold Morowitz, who first put up the idea years ago. In June 2017, astronomer Jane Greaves from Cardiff University in Wales set out to use the James Clerk Maxwell Telescope in Hawaii to search for indications of different chemicals on Venus in an effort to test that notion. Radio waves of different wavelengths propagating through the clouds will be absorbed by various molecular species. Different species of molecules will absorb radio waves coming through the clouds at different characteristic wavelengths. One of the chemicals was phosphine. She did not expect to find it. Chemists compare phosphine to a pyramid, one atom of phosphorus topping a base of three hydrogen atoms. The NASA spacecraft Cassini detected it in the atmospheres of Jupiter and Saturn. In that setting, Dr. Sousa Silva said, life is not necessary to form phosphine. The immense heat and pressures can jam the phosphorus and hydrogen atoms together to form the molecule. The scientists claim that smaller, rocky planets like Venus and Earth do not have enough energy to generate large quantities of phosphine in the same manner. Anaerobic life, or microbes that don't consume or need oxygen, seems to be exceptionally good at making it, nonetheless. On such worlds, as far as we can tell, only life can make phosphine, Dr. Sousa Silva said. Theoretically, she has long investigated the gas in the hopes that its detection as an emission from rocky planets orbiting other stars would provide evidence of the existence of life beyond Earth. On our planet, phosphine can be found in several anaerobic organisms' surroundings, including our intestines, the excrement of penguins and badgers, and even in some deep water worms. It is also extremely poisonous. Militaries have employed it for chemical warfare, and it is used as a fumigant on farms. On the TV show Breaking Bad, the main character Walter White makes it to kill two rivals. Its production by Earth's bacteria remains a mystery, though. There's not a lot of understanding of where it's coming from, how it forms, things like that, said Matthew Pasek, a geoscientist at the University of South Florida in Tampa. We've seen it associated with where microbes are at, but we have not seen a microbe do it, which is a subtle difference, but an important one. The Atacama Large Millimeter Array in Chile was utilized in March 2019 by the scientific team as a more powerful telescope per the team's initial requirement. This time they discovered phosphine, and a lot of it, with concentrations between 5 and 20 parts per billion. Those are millions of times greater than what is in Earth's atmosphere, even though they may appear to be small amounts. Over the course of a year, the researchers used computer simulations to recreate Venus's atmosphere and investigate potential causes and quantities of phosphine. The phosphine must be restocked frequently since it is continually being broken down by the light. Based on their models, the researchers concluded that Venus's volcanic activity and lightning wouldn't be enough to replenish the planet's dwindling supply of phosphine. Yet, the gas could be released sufficiently by living organisms. The finding also follows a history of detections of gases on other worlds that can be byproducts of life. But these gases, such as burps of methane or oxygen on Mars, can also be produced by chemical reactions that do not involve life at all. Though interesting, these signals do not yet constitute definitive evidence of extraterrestrial life. While few doubt whether this phosphine is there, what kind of life in the clouds of Venus would it take to actually make the gas? Such species would have had to adapt to live in an acidic environment, maybe developing shells like the minuscule creatures that inhabit the planet's harshest climates. Microbes floating on gravity waves might live, metabolize, and multiply inside sulfuric acid and water droplets According to Dr. Seeger and colleagues, there would be an abundance of these bacteria due to the gas production. Regarding the origins of these bacteria, she speculated that they may have started on Venus's surface during its oceanic days, up to 700 million years ago, but were pushed into the skies when the planet's oceans dried up. No one has determined if the bacteria, if they exist, share our DNA or have a completely distinct basis. You can't help but be Earth-centric when you search for extraterrestrial life. Why? Because that single data point is all we have. The researchers are eager to get additional data from the telescope 
and have their models question before they let their imaginations run wild. The search could possibly be advanced by sending robots to Venus in space missions. Our chances of finding life on other planets have increased dramatically over the last two decades, thanks to a steady stream of new discoveries. Not many scientists would have predicted that Venus would play such a pivotal role in this debate. However, Venus is showing itself to be an intriguing site of discovery, similar to a growing number of planetary worlds. While questions like the formation of galaxies and the nature of black holes in space rank among the most monumental in the history of science, we also have some of these profound mysteries right here in our solar system. Learning about the planets and moons in our solar system helps us envision what the cosmos is capable of. The more we learn about the universe in our own cosmic backyard, the more we will be able to comprehend the possibilities out there. Discoveries of habitable planets on potentially hostile worlds like Mars might shed light on the prevalence of life in our solar system and beyond. It may be possible to gain some insight into the frequency of planetary extinctions around other stars if we can deduce the causes of the demise of Venus and other potentially once vibrant worlds. We learn more about our purpose, our potential remaining time on Earth, and the things we could leave behind by delving into the most intriguing mysteries of our solar system. Scientists believe they understood the Moon's formation process prior to the Moon landings. The commonly held belief was that it coalesced from leftover material from the Sun's formation, much like the planets. However, when Apollo astronauts returned from the Moon with rock samples, the results revealed an entirely different scenario. Geologists had found that the Moon was covered in a special kind of rock called anorthosite, unexplainable senior producer Meredith Hodnot explains on the show. Glittery, bright, and reflective, this is the rock that makes the Moon shine white in the night sky. And at the time, it was thought, this rock can only be formed in a very specific way, magma. However, the presence of magma suggests that the moon was formed during a catastrophic event. So much energy was directed toward the moon that it melted, according to Hodnot. How it all unfolded is a mystery to scientists. However, in every case, there is a cinematic tale of epic infernal apocalypse. Has Earth previously been home to a more sophisticated culture? Is there sentient life in space? That is a question that has persisted for a long time among scientists. On the other hand, astronomer Adam Frank and climate scientist Gavin Schmidt want to know if intelligent life existed in the distant past of our planet. Is it possible that among the Earth's layers lie artifacts from a sophisticated non-human culture that flourished hundreds of millions of years ago? Although it may not pertain specifically to our solar system, this riddle has a cosmic scope. The key question that Schmidt and Frank are posing is, what are the odds of any intelligent life form on any planet in any part of the universe, leaving some kind of trace, some indication that they were here? Also, if we vanish completely, will extraterrestrial visitors who come to Earth in the distant future be able to detect any signs of human life? More so, could a true ninth planet be hiding in the shadows? Pluto was not included, in the revised 2006 definition of a planet by the International Astronomical Union. There were formerly nine recognized planets in our solar system, but now there are just eight. But then we began to receive indications that there is in fact a reality beyond Neptune and a genuine gigantic planet that we believe is still out there, ready to be discovered. Other objects far outside the solar system appear to be affected by its gravity leading astronomers to believe its existence even though they have not yet detected the planet. Could these hints lead us to a true new ninth planet? Maybe, but it will be hard to find. It's kind of like taking a little black grain of sand and throwing it on the beach. Finding that one amidst all the others would be a bit of a challenge. And that's the problem with Planet Nine. Regardless, extrasolar planets continue to be discovered in the most unexpected locations by astronomers. Aside from sweltering Jupiters that encircle their stars, there are rocky worlds like Earth that orbit around numerous suns, and even rogue planets that roam the galaxy at will. A gigantic but exceedingly dim brown dwarf, a failed star, 
is now being circled by a planet similar to Venus, according to astronomers employing a gravitational magnifying glass. This unusual combination may provide light on the formation of planets and moons, which could aid in the search for potentially hospitable worlds, such as moons that are suitable for life or planets that are similar to Earth. I wouldn't say this proves anything, but it's the first hint that there might be a universality in how companions form at all these different scales," says Ohio State University Andrew Gould. Once newborn stars are formed when chilly clouds of gas and dust are pulled together by gravity, they are encircled by spinning disks of leftover material. Planets are formed when dense regions inside these disks come together. It is also believed that the largest moons of Jupiter formed from a disk of material surrounding the gas giant while it was still a baby. In contrast, brown dwarfs are neither stars nor planets, but they are big enough to have started fusion, but not big enough to keep it going like stars. That the Venusian world and its brown dwarf are so similar in mass to Jupiter and its major moons, as well as the Sun and the outer ice planets, is intriguing. This suggests that several things of varying sizes may have originated from the same process. Moon formation from a circumplanetary disk similar to the Galilean satellites would be a universal process if this item originated similarly to Jupiter's moons. A link between planets and their moons is provided by the newly discovered exo-Venus. To be more precise, the star would be a planet and the new body would be called an exo-moon if its brown dwarf host were somewhat smaller. The new mechanism limits the maximum size of a moon relative to its orbital object, according to Kipping. A planet the size of Jupiter would not have the gravitational pull to support the creation of a planet the size of Earth within its orbital disk, even though massive things can be captured. It takes a host as huge as a brown dwarf, he argues, to construct a moon the size of Earth or Venus. The quest for habitable worlds by astronomers is a major motivation for studying exomoons. Therefore, understanding their boundaries is crucial. Even though our solar system's huge moons are too far from the sun to support surface water, they are among the best locations to look for alien life since several of them have seas beneath the surface. Plus, big exomoons around faraway gas giants may be able to hold surface water if they spin near enough to their sun, according to researchers. Even though no exomoons have been found so far, space telescopes like NASA's Kepler are actively looking for them. Could life exist on a planet that resembles Venus? Per Gould, that is quite unlikely. Brown dwarfs are extremely cold because they lack core heat from fusion, and this planet is probably too far away from its star to be habitable at this distance. The technique employed to detect the dark planet around a dim star does, however, provide obstacles to additional research. A planet hunting method called microlensing was employed to detect the Venus-like planet. This method depends on light from a star that lies behind the brown dwarf. Brown dwarfs allow scientists to detect both the incredibly faint star and its orbiting planet by bending and magnifying the light of the background star. Observing planets orbiting brown dwarfs using any method other than microlensing is exceedingly challenging, but not impossible. Microlensing can reveal the existence of a brown dwarf even when it is not generating much light. Unfortunately, researchers are unable to analyze these worlds again to identify atmospheric properties that would assist in characterizing their habitability, as microlensing relies on the exact alignment of the system with a background star. Extracting relevant details is the primary obstacle to microlensing. Mass, distance, and velocity relative to the background star, as well as any planets in orbit around the target star, are all contained in the signal. Similar to how you would be asked to calculate the length breadth and number of stories of a house given its square footage, astronomers frequently lack the data necessary to distinguish between them. When two stars are in a mutual orbit, known as a binary system, astronomers nearly always have an additional piece of information that allows them to determine the mass of any planets in the system. Furthermore, this newly discovered system is located around 10 times closer to Earth than the majority of known microlensed systems which facilitates the extraction of fluctuations in its signal and, by extension, the mass of the planet. 
NASA is looking forward to more microlensing detections in the future. Thanks for watching another episode of Voyager. While you're still here, make sure to click the video on your screen for more mind-blowing videos about space.